Welcome back to Season 4, Episode 8 of HR as the White Swan. I'm Ellie Clark, the CEO of HRO Today. We publish HR Today Magazine, HRO Today EMEA, and HRO Today APAC, as well as host the HRO Today forums around the world, and we manage the HRO Today Association. HR is the white swan is, of course, a reference to the positive energy that HR needs to bring to any organization in the wake of negative or black swan events. We've really been focusing on rewards and recognition as one of those sources of positive impact on employee culture, employee productivity, and employee engagement. Our podcast is brought to you today by Madison Performance, one of the highest rated providers in rewards and recognition, software and services by the HR Today magazine, Baker's Dozen. And our guest is, once again, Senior Vice President of Madison Performance, Judd Weisgall, who's got more than a decade of experience helping some of the world's largest companies develop reward and recognition programs. So, Judd, welcome back. Thank you. So, in Episode 7, I teased that we were hoping everyone would advance to the next episode. And of course, in each episode, we start the question I put to you with the letters from the words white swan. And we're up to A, and our word is advance. Actually, the audience is going to figure out that I'm always trying to tease the next uh, episode, but really we're talking about advancing and evolving the programs. There are some organizations that are constantly sort of updating, and it's an important thing for them that each year they meet best practice benchmarks and they're moving forward. And then others just say, hey, we did it. We've checked the box. They put it on a shelf. They leave it alone. So let's talk a little bit about the importance of evolving or advancing the program and what the best processes are to make sure that you're sort of updating the way you're doing things and that you can sort of re-engage and reignite passion around the rewards and recognition programs for the associates that work for a company. You know, we've talked about this a lot in many previous episodes, but never so specifically. And here's the thing that I often say. Programs don't just magically evolve and grow. They need nurturing, constant nurturing. And one way to look at this is through a lens of demographics, right? So many changes are happening, and at some organizations, it's faster than at others. But the change in demographic composition is happening nonetheless, and we're seeing more millennial and Gen Z workers enter the mix and, in fact, becoming the dominant mass of the workforce. It seems that everyone knows this and acknowledges it, but we aren't always so quick to make the changes to our reward and recognition programs because of it. So, example, we hear time and again that these younger demographics want to do things like donate to charity through their programs or have reward and recognition be a part of their career road mapping, even have the ability to redeem rewards for career-based meetings and training, such as an hour with a C-level executive. But time and time again, we see programs that are still using, you know, archaic approaches. And I'll tread lightly here because I acknowledge that every organization is different, but the bulk that I encounter, Elliot, I'm not finding a high value and high response or appreciation rate with, you know, an approach that worked as a mainstay 20 plus years ago. The needs of the audience have shifted. The wants of the audience have shifted. And that's why you have to consistently shift your approach towards the programs. What's needed now, more often than not, is a redesign of a program that's in place. So a simple way to look at it is, When was the last time you changed the program and offering in a meaningful way? The technology, the offerings, the messages, all of it. And if the answer is, and it likely is, three plus years, it's been too long. Think about all that's changed in your company in three years. The new hires, the new goals and objectives, the new leaders, everything. How are you incorporating reward and recognition into that? How are you maximizing the benefit to influence positive and affecting change? This is how programs either thrive or they die on the vine. Typically in our industry, contracts are three years in length, right? That's why I pull that number, three years. And that's a fair amount of time for a contracted partnership, sure. But it's a lot of time in the sense of, as you said earlier, set it and forget it. Or rather, to implement and make no changes until the next contract cycle. So consider that if you want to have success in this venture, what you need is a roadmap for it, a plan that extends past launch, incorporates changes and new programs that will support this ever-changing workforce and its goals and objectives. This is how you take a nice-to-have and you turn it into a must-have, right? We also see organizations buying these programs as though they're tangible goods. That's not a good idea. 
And I understand this is the way it is because for decades, reward and recognition was simply that, right? It was gifts. But here we are now with high technology, an ever-changing workforce that's highly evolved, and new expectations from our spend on this effort. So it's critical to remember that you are buying a service, partnership, and a plan. The stuff that employees get, that's the end result of success on all of these fronts. So think about approaching your program with an eye towards the plan and how your partner can help you grow and evolve it by a strong partnership, by a strong sense of history and helping other companies reach these goals, by expertise with the demands of meeting needs of a multi-generational workforce, by thinking of this as a service partnership and plan rather than a merchandise purchase you will set yourself up with a partner that can assist you with ensuring that the program thrives because they come with a plan. First of all, one thing I want to be clear is you've established that people should not buy rewards and recognition from Emerald Legacy because that set it and forget it thing doesn't work. Okay, good. This is not your typical easy bake oven. You know, it is interesting. How often do you think that companies, the HR departments that are managing these programs, think about asking employees what will excite them? You know, I know of one case where, um, you know, the company had this, and it was fairly sizable at this point, sort of employee of the month kind of recognition program based on both manager or accumulation of points from both managers and other associates. You know, they went and asked the employees because they thought that, you know, what employees most feared was being in the presence of executives. And actually, the, the employee of the month, and there were different divisions, so there'd be like three or four each month. The idea of spending an hour with the CEO was something that was attractive, not repulsive to the employees. But how they found that out was they asked employees what would really interest you. And the CEO who told me the story said that actually after it started, he got some really great ideas about how to improve the business. Because they sat there and said, hey, you know, I would do these things differently or whatever. He just got to know about people and their lives and what they were doing. So he was a terrible candidate for undercover boss after this. Um, (laughs) But, you know, which is a program I'm well documented, I believe should never have existed. You know, should companies go to their employees as well as brainstorm with you folks about, you know, what's going to excite you? You know, what's going to be a difference? The company's based in Las Vegas, giving the employee the opportunity to visit headquarters for a three-day, you know, weekend trip or whatever the case Mm -hmm. may be. Do they go out and ask that? You know, it goes back to something that we discussed previously in the series, which is don't ask questions you don't want to know the answers to and that you're not prepared to take action on. So, yes, many do ask probably anecdotally have to take action on it. So you do want to, and you should, and I think it's critical to survey your audience and make sure that you're finding out what is important to them, what they want, what they need, what will make them feel connected and appreciated and seen, and that they got to bring their, you know, sort of true selves to work and that that's an appreciated value add to the company as a whole. I think it's absolutely critical. I also think, and this may earn cheers from our audience for this podcast, but I may get some hate mail from a different department, but I do think One of the challenges we see in the whole process is, and I alluded to this earlier in this episode, which is the way in which the service is being purchased. I spoke about it as being purchased as a product, and it's not. It's a service, and service implies exactly that. It means the partner has to bring to the table the ideas, the commitment, the customer service, the experience, all of it to the table. And that includes things like making suggestions to survey your audience. And what we see time and again, even from the most well-established organizations in the world, are requests for proposals, RFPs that come to us that are ultimately looking for wording that supports buying a product. And so I urge all of our HR audience to ensure that questions are being asked of your potential partners as well as us, your existing partner, to what is the service all about? What services do you offer? How are you going to help us poll our audience, ask questions? Do you help us come up with what questions are great to be asked? And I don't see much of that in the buying process. And I think there is a large gap between the types of questions we're being asked during the buying process versus the actual needs of the partner once the business is won. And so when I speak about that, I think, you know, it plays a large part in ensuring that your programs thrive and grow and that they take care of the things that your audience is actually looking for because you bought the right thing in the right way. 
great point. I'm going to bring in the word advance in a different way in evolution. The, part of that is the advance in evolution of the industry, right? So the rewards and recognition industry, if you go back 20, 30 years ago, was basically you were buying a catalog program and a distribution platform product, commodities, you know, mm-hmm. jewelry, watches, gift cards, etc. That's basically what you were buying. You were buying this platform and, you know, it wasn't really anything other than check the box, send the gift. Nowadays, you're buying software and you're buying consultation. Those old catalog-based companies, they still exist, but really, the you look at the biggest players in the market, the thrust of their businesses have really moved toward technology and consultation. So it sounds like what you're saying is not all of the HR departments have caught up to the idea that this is software and consulting bundled together as a service, and they're not asking the consulting piece or not taking advantage of the consulting piece effectively. Is that a fair sort of description? Because it sounds to me, you know, from outside the industry, and you sit inside, that that's really part of the problem is that companies are not reoriented their thinking to realize, hey, this is a whole different ballgame than what it was even a decade ago. It's absolutely, in my view, one of the biggest challenges we face, which is to gently nudge during the buying process, the buyer towards understanding what it is we as an industry do now. Not what we did 10 years ago, 20 years ago, even five years ago. It's such a shift. It's such a paradigm shift. And I think when we get, you know, these 600 question RFPs about our services, 450 questions don't even apply to what our industry does. And they'll ask for information and items and details that are almost impossible to provide because they're referring to the way it was, to your point, product being purchased almost like the old service merchandise catalog. That's not where the industry is today. So it's important for our HR leaders listening to this to remember that they may have to rely on a procurement professional to help them with this, but they should also be helping that procurement professional make sure that the right questions are being asked and that the things they're going to need are part of that intake of a new partner because that sets everyone up for success, I think. All right. Well, I hope everyone heard that loud and clear. You not only need to work on advancing your program, you have to advance your thinking. You know, what can these companies provide? And am I taking advantage of the gray matter that comes with someone, you know, like Judd, who have the advantage to not only see what you're doing with your program, but across a very broad swath of the world of business, working with lots of different companies and lots of different verticals and take advantage of that. So great conversation, Judd. Once again, thank you. And again, want to thank Judd Weisgall. He's the Senior Vice President of Madison Performance Group. And I'm Elliot Clark, CEO of HRO Today. We hope that you can see your way clear that this series will reach the exciting culmination in episode nine, the letter N is coming up. And we uh, hope that you'll tune in for that and can navigate your way through everything that we've explained. Thank you, and we'll look forward to you joining our next HR is the White Swan podcast. To listen to additional podcasts in the White Swan series, visit www.madisonpg.com. On their website, you can also speak to Judd Weiskow to discuss this topic or to speak to him about your rewards and recognition program. 